something very powerful and awesome is going on in America and the world today. God's doing something very hidden. It's very quiet, but it's so awesome and supernatural that it's beyond human comprehension. In fact, what the Lord's doing right now is going to affect the whole world in these last days. And here's what it is. He's preparing a very small but most powerful army of dedicated Christians who are more dedicated than anybody who followed Hitler. I was reading a book recently, a picture book of the story of the rise and fall of the German Reich and of Hitler, and he started with an army of young people who were ready to lay down their lives, and many of them just laid down their lives to die for Adolf Hitler. But this is going to be an army more dedicated than even the communists. They were considered to be among the most loyal people on the face of the earth. Now God is destroying communism all over the world. This army is going to be more dedicated and devoted to the cause of Christ than all of those over one million young people, mostly teenagers, that were killed in absolute obedience to the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran. They often, without guns, they just waves and waves of teenagers went against the Iraqi fortresses and guns, and they were mowed down by the thousands. Over a million young men died sacrificing their life for the Ayatollah. But folks, this army that God is raising up is going to be the most dedicated army on the face of the earth. Never before anyone is pure, devoted, and fearless as this remnant that's coming forth. They're going to come forth and do exploits, and they're going to shake hell, literally. <clears throat> now, I, I have heard all my life about our godly forefathers, the, the, the mothers of Zion, the fathers of Zion, men who spent hours and days in prayer, who fasted, who, who had the ability and the power to stand up against the wave of immorality in their day. And, and I've often thought about those great forefathers. Many of them are dead. They're gone. But folks, the army that God's going to raise up and is in the process of raising up right now, not going to be made up primarily of gray-haired old prophets. Many of those gray-haired old prophets are sitting in front of television now getting fat and have lost the touch and anointing of God. God's bypassed them long ago. This, this new army is going to be made up of handmaidens of the Lord. It's going to be made up of servants of the Lord, ordinary Christians who lay hold of God, and God lays hold of them, and a whole new realm of of service, a whole new realm of the moving of the Holy Spirit is about to break forth. <clears throat> right now, if you look at the, at the church religious system, you lose heart. In many Pentecostal churches, <clears throat> many all over the United States, at least 50% of the congregation are now divorced. In some southern cities, 80% of the congregation is divorced. When you look at pastors and churches rocking and rolling, when you see pastors turning to positive thinking, when, when, you, you, when you hear even evangelical pastors get up with foolishness and frivolity, you ought to see the, the letters that are coming in to us of pastors that are falling on every side. I got a letter the other day. We read it at our minister's meeting. We received a congregation praying for the pastor because he was caught. He's a, an addicted gambler. There was a gambler in the pulpit preaching. Adulterers, fornicators, those that are involved in the occult and witchcraft, creeping into the church of Jesus Christ. And if you look at the, <clears throat> what is called the denominational church system today, you lose heart. And you say, there's no influence, there's no power. What's happening? <clears throat> Folks, you're not supposed to fret, according to my Bible, because God has a plan. God has a plan. He's always had a plan. And that plan is no secret. It's here in this book. It's clearly revealed. <clears throat> Much of God's plan that I want to share with you can be found in 1 Samuel. And I want you to turn to 1 Samuel with me, if you will, please. The third chapter. Because God's plan for what he's going to do, <clears throat> he's going to raise up a Samuel company. Hallelujah. The holy remnant. 1 Samuel, third chapter. And my whole message is coming out of this chapter. I want you to look at verse 11, chapter 3. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, <clears throat> I will do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. 
Can you see it? Read it again. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'll do a thing in Israel, which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. Both ears, everybody's ears, are going to be tingling. It's going to be a shocking thing that God does. <clears throat> this new thing is going to amaze and startle everybody. Do you know what it was? It's the judgment of God on an old religious system <clears throat> and the raising up of a whole new program of the Holy Ghost. That's what you see in 1 Samuel. In fact, the first six, seven chapters, it's all about the death of an old church religious system and the birthing of a new <clears throat> holy remnant. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to keep in mind that what God did in Samuel's day, he keeps doing in every generation. In every generation, when the, when the so-called church, the organized church, backslides and gets cold and compromising, God just gives up on it and raises up another. He's always had a people after his heart. He's always had a praying people. In every generation, he's had, he's had that little spark of fire. And when the old dies, he just fans the new and starts all over again. And that's called the remnant. All through the ages, there's been a remnant. But all this remnant that's coming is going to be beyond anything the world has seen. <coughs> Eli represents the old religious system. He had two sons, Hophna and Phinehas. And they were devils. They were sons of Belial, according to the Scripture. You see that chapter 2, verse 12. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial, or sons of the devil. They knew not the Lord. <coughs> Folks, look at me, please. Eli's 90, over 90 years of age. He's fat. He's stiff-necked. He's lost the touch of God. God's no longer talking to him. He doesn't hear from God. Nobody was hearing from God. There was one prophet, unnamed, who came to Sam and warned him. He said, I'm going to send judgment and cut you off because you're soft on sin. But Eli and his two sons represent the dead, cold, formal church who are going through the motions of form of godliness, no power. These men, these two sons of Eli, and Eli and his two sons represented the ministry, the priesthood. And the ministry was corrupt. The two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they didn't want to eat sodden flesh. Now, when they brought the sacrifice, it went into the big pot, and they would seethe it, boil it. <clears throat> the priest had a three-pronged hook. He would pull out whatever came out on that three-pronged hook was for their table. But they didn't want that. They wanted filet mignon, red raw meat. So they would meet the people who brought their sacrifices. <clears throat> They'd bring a heifer. And they say, look, we're going to kill it now. We bleed it here, and we're going to take the prime meat. Prime rib goes to our table for our priesthood. Eli knew they were doing it. He got addicted to that red raw meat. That's how he got fat, I guess. I don't know. He knew what they were doing. He knew the meat he was eating was abominable, but he didn't correct his sons. His two sons were adulterers. They would pick out women that came to serve the Lord, and they would seduce them right at the temple gate, right at the tabernacle doors. The, these men were covetous. They had no fear of God. They didn't even know the Lord, and yet they're going through all the sacrifices. <clears throat> they were ministering to the people, even in the <clears throat> holy place. They even went into the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. They were devils. Folks, <clears throat> you see a picture here of how the ministry and how the organized church has gone. When you've got preachers like we have right over here in New Jersey, Bishop Spong, uh, <clears throat> pushing for homosexuals to be ordained, whole denominations now accepting homosexuals, whole denominations saying that homosexuality is pleasing to God. Entire homosexual denomination now, and they're going to be brought into the National Council of Churches, you see a backslidden, corrupt ministry falling on the left and the right. Okay. Why are you hanging your head? Thank you. <laughs> Doesn't the, how many of you here have seen the way the denomination of churches have just gone down into moral landslide, into mud and filth. It's a stench in God's nostrils. But see, Eli winked at it. God said, I have told him that I'll judge his house forever, 
for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. He refused to judge and correct. Now, folks, that's exactly what's happened in America today. There are multitudes of thousands of pastors and shepherds who will not reprove their congregation. They will not call sin, sin. Not at all because they're soft on sin, because they've grown comfortable in their positions. Folks, I, I, I think I told you once of talking to, <clears throat> I think there were seven of them, six or seven pastors visiting from a southern state. These were Pentecostal pastors. And I was telling them about my concern of, of all of the corruption that's creeping in the church, the, in the music and in the pulpit itself, and, and this lack of correction in the church. And I turned to one pastor and I said, Is this true that, that pastors are afraid to correct people because they're afraid they'll lose some money? People who won't help pay the mortgage. I said, Tell me that's not true. And the pastor bowed his head. He was the leader of this group. And he said... I'm afraid it's so, David. And every one of them bowed their head. And one pastor said, Brother David, I've got to confess. I've been afraid to speak out. He said, I'm afraid if I speak out, half my congregation will leave me. And every one in that circle, Pentecostal pastors, said, I, we, we, what they're really saying, we're very easy on the people. We don't want to offend anybody. In fact, some churches are called outsider-friendly churches to make it friendly. Folks, you can go to a friendly church and go straight to hell. I don't want to go to an outsider-friendly church. I want to hear the word of the Lord. Sharp is a two-edged sword that pierces to the very marrow of the bone. <clears throat> Folks, you, you show me. Just show me ten men of God, gray-haired men of God left in America today. Name ten. Name five. Gray-haired men of God, old prophets. Name me five. Remember what Abraham said, Lord, if there's even ten righteous, you name me those ten, even five men who are standing in an international pulpit and crying out against sin. Name them. Show me gray-haired men who stayed true all these years. They've been on their face before God. And they can get up like a Samuel. And their words don't fall to the ground. And you know by looking and hearing, there's a man that walks with God. He's holy. He's righteous. He's heard from heaven. And he can say, Thus saith the Lord. Name me five of them. They don't manipulate the crowds. They're not looking for money. They don't have television cameras around them. But they're men of prayer. They're men of God. They're seeking the face of God. There are not five left in the country. At least not that I know. Thank God for the young ones that he's raising up that have the fire and the glory of God. You see, that's why God has to do a new thing. This old system is rocking itself into oblivion. In a rocking chair growing prosperous and fat and afraid to deal with sin. And God got fed up with this Eli church at Silo. He sent a prophet with a word of prophecy. He said, Behold, the day is coming. Pointed a finger to Eli. And this prophet, the Bible doesn't tell his name. You can find that in the second chapter, beginning at 27th verse, right down the rest of the chapter. This prophet looked at Eli. And he said, Behold, the day is coming. I'm going to cut off your arm. I'll cut off your arm. You know what that means? I'm going to take my spirit away from you. I'm going to take my blessing away from you. I'm going to cut off the glory of God in your midst. I'm going to cut off your... His arm was the power of God, the anointing of God. God said, I'm going to take away your anointing. He said, I'm going to quit this house at Shiloh. I'm going to remove my presence. I'll make you powerless. I'll judge your wicked pastors. I'm going to pronounce Ichabod on you. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation. The habitation was the house of God, the tabernacle at Shiloh. And this prophet said, God sent me to tell you, because you're soft on sin, you allow wickedness in my house. You don't reprove. You have grown weary with God's service. You don't have a heart for God or a heart of prayer anymore. You backslid, you're cold. And because of that, I'm going to cut off your influence, <clears throat> take my spirit from you, 
and there's going to be an enemy place in your place. The enemy is going to come in. But God is saying, I'm giving up on Shiloh. I'm giving up on this church. I'm giving it up, and I'm going to give it over to the hands of the enemy. Now, folks, that's exactly what's happening in America and the world today. The organized religious system has been turned over to the enemy. The enemy. Do you know that the National Council of Churches, their multitudes of uh, the, the money that they have, much of their so-called discretionary funds goes to support communist guerrillas around the world. Churches supporting communist, godless communist. Amazing. We, we sit in America and we wonder why the church doesn't have influence. The church in New York City, I'm talking about the denominational churches from the cathedrals on, they're just <coughs> mausoleums. They're dead. They're funeral parlors. They have no life. They have no strength. Their word doesn't mean anything. Because God's walked away from it all. God said, I cut off your arm and I'm going to put an enemy in the tabernacle. And that's what the Bible says is going to happen the last day. There are going to be men standing in the pulpit that are going to give the people what they want. If you've got idolatry in your heart, you're going to wind up in a church with a preacher with idolatry in his heart. And that preacher is going to minister to that idol that's in your heart. He's going to tell you it's okay to sin. He's going to tell you it's all right to go easy. It's all right to have fun. It's all right to be a sports fanatic and not pray or seek the face of God. That's what's happening all over America. The old system is dying. God is leaving it. He's already left most of it. You can go to many churches, even Pentecostal churches, and it's death. God's not there. God's gone. The church of Shiloh was abandoned by God, and it was judged by the Lord. And Israel was smitten, and they fled every man to his own tent. And there was a great slaughter for these fellow of Israel, for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. The ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. In one day, God said enough. In one day, God came in. The ark of the Lord was captured, which means the presence of God has moved now far, far away. The glory of the Lord's departed. Ichabod is born. Not only that, God moved in judgment quickly on the ministry. Folks, what you're seeing now is what God said in this book, judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. That's why you see men falling on the left and falling on the right. Not just suicides. Not, not just people being removed from the ministry. Not just being exposed for adultery and witchcraft or gambling. But they're falling dead. They're falling literally. And the day is coming. God is going to deal so severely with the wicked congregations. The wicked servants of the Lord that are backslidden. God's going to move with great judgment. We see it now in the land. When Eli heard the news that the ark was taken, his sons were killed. The Bible said he fell over and fell over off the seat backwards and broke his neck and he died, for he was an old man and fat. His stiff neck fell and died. He was 98 years old when he died. <clears throat> this is a vivid picture of what's happening to organized religion. It's under judgment. Its ministers are falling. The leaders are spiritually dead. But folks, <clears throat> here's what the Scripture says. In fact, I want you to turn to Jeremiah. I want to show you something. Jeremiah, the seventh chapter. Jeremiah 7. This is going to make sense to you in just a minute. Jeremiah, the seventh chapter. Once again, Jeremiah is talking about that organized religious system. <clears throat> Verse 9, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and then come and stand before me in this house, 
which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. In other words, we're safe. We're no danger. We're not going to lose our salvation. Verse 11, in this house which is called by my name, is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? I've seen it, saith the Lord, but go now unto my place which was in Silo. That was Eli's church, the church that I'm talking about. The prophet says, go back now to my place which was in Silo. And I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you've done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you rising early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto this place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight. I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. You see what God is saying? <clears throat> I'm doing away with this thing. There's no chance of repentance. Doesn't mean that God isn't as merciful as he's always been. God's still loving and his heart bleeds. But he's saying, there's no hope for this church. It's given up. I, I cannot work with this church anymore. And so God says, in every generation, he's saying it to us, go back to Shiloh. Go back to the church of Eli. See what I did to Hophni and Phinehas. See what I did when I took my glory and my presence away from Shiloh. And God said, well, there's sin in the camp. The glory is going to depart. While the church of Eli was under judgment and being forsaken by the glory of the Lord and taken over by the devil, God was busy raising up a remnant. And Samuel represents the holy remnant. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully now. I want to take you into this book, into this chapter, and I want to show you how God trained Samuel to come up to take the place of this dead religious system, how God had a plan. And this is what God's going to do. This is what he's doing right now. He's training some of you that are here now. Many of you are being trained by the Holy Ghost because you're going to be a part of this, this army that he's raising up. I want you to listen very closely. And I, I believe when I'm finished, you'll be able to know whether or not you're a part of this remnant that he's raising up to do his work in the last day. <clears throat> Here's the training and preparation of a holy remnant. First of all, the remnant is always birthed in prayer and intercession. <clears throat> always. Hannah birthed Samuel to bitter tears and much prayer. Scripture says, and she was in grief of soul. This is 1 Samuel 1.10. She was in grief of soul. She prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Now, keep in mind that Elkanah, her, her uh, husband, had two wives. Peninnah was the other wife. She had children. <clears throat> Hannah had none. And the Bible says her adversary provoked her sore and made her fret. Listen to me, please. Get the picture. Hannah is at the temple of God every day on her knees standing before the altar of God. And she's so crushed and broken <clears throat> because she's childless. And she's there before the altar, weeping every day, seeking the face of God. Her adversary is making fun of her so that she's fretting. And Hannah is saying, oh, so Lord, all I'm doing is giving myself to you in prayer, and I'm being harassed by an adversary. I'm being harassed constantly by an adversary. <clears throat> the remnant which, represents, which Samuel represents was born in grief, intercession, pain, sorrow, through provoking, provoking of adversaries, and through misunderstanding. It came to pass, as she was continual, continually praying before the Lord, that Eli was watching her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, and only her lips were moving. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunken? Put away the wine from you. Isn't that amazing? How people who pray, give themselves to God, are so clearly misunderstood. They're misunderstood. 
Listen to it very clearly here. It's, it's powerful. It's something you, you've got to get it into your mind here. He looks at her. And she is so full of grief. She's so burdened for the work of God. All she can do is move her mouth. She's groaning in the spirit. Eli is so out of touch with God. Eli is so <clears throat> dead in his spirit. He thinks she's drunk. He says, woman, how long are you going to come in here drunk? Put your bottle away. Isn't that amazing to a man who won't correct his own sons? They won't even correct all he told his boys. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. But he lost all his spiritual authority because he had never really corrected those boys. And those boys knew that he loved that red meat that he was eating. Listen, please. If you're going to seek God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and you're going to feel the pain and the grief of God for his church, you're going to suffer consequences. You're going to be misunderstood on all sides. You're going to people accuse you of all kinds of things. Hannah prayed, if you give me a man, child, I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. Then she turned to Eli and said, don't look on me as a wicked woman or a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my sorrow and grief have I spoken up to this point. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, God heard her prayer. And the word, the name Samuel means God heard my prayer. That's what Samuel means. And folks, God's hearing the prayer of a people in his house, a people who yearn for an outpouring of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Of people who yearn for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon their sons and their daughters. Of people who want to see the glory of the Lord come down on his church. Of people who want to see God move in a very special way in these last days. God's going to hear their cry. If, if you've been wooed to prayer, if God's been calling you to prayer, you're feeling the grief of God. Now, I'm not talking about spending five, ten hours a day in prayer. I know people who pray many hours who never touch God. They never feel the grief and the pain of God's heart. No, there are people who are really on their face seeking Him. <clears throat> Hallelujah. These are people who are pouring their heart out to God. And there were people that were given, according to Hannah, given to the Lord all the days of their life. These people are so committed, there's no thought of backsliding. There's no up and down, in and out, hot and cold. They are wholly given to the heart of God. Oh, God, raise up a people like that in Times Square Church. People who you don't have to worry about. People you don't have to wonder, well, what they're going through now? Is this crisis going to blow them away? No, because they're growing in the Lord. There's, no, there's not a hint, there's not a chance they're going to turn their back on God. They're wholly given to the Lord. Do you know what it's all about when you're in trouble or in a crisis to go to God and pour your heart out? What do you do when you're in trouble? Go to a counselor, pick up the phone and talk to a friend for an hour or two? Folks, I want you to know that this remnant is going to go to the heart of God and pour out their soul. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart to Him. David, when he was in trouble, said, When I remembered all these things, then I went to Him and poured out my soul in me. I emptied myself. Folks, when I'm in trouble, when I'm in sorrow, when I'm in pain, I go to God, I bury my heart. I empty my heart. I come out completely empty. This remnant is going to know how to pour out their soul to God. Do you know that Samuel was such a man of prayer that when the people <clears throat> came to him, they didn't ask for counseling, they asked for his prayers. When they asked for a king, God sent a mighty thunderstorm. And in fact, the thunderstorm came because Samuel prayed it down. Samuel, don't listen to it. The Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. Time after time, read it. You'll, you'll hear them come to Samuel. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Why? People learn to trust their prayers. And folks, they're going to be a praying remnant. That people will go, not for counseling, but for prayer. They're going to say, I know somebody going to touch God. God wants to make you that person. That you are touching God, that you hear from God, and people, God will give you a ministry of people coming to you with their burdens and their trials, and you out there 
saying, Thus saith the Lord. You'll lay hands on them and pray. And while you're praying, the word of the Lord and the power of God will come forth. And God will answer their prayer. God wants to raise up prayer warriors who've touched heaven. Now, secondly, in the training of the remnant, it's going to be trained to know the voice of the Lord. Now, this was a time when God wasn't speaking to Israel because of the sinfulness of the ministry and the people. The Bible said, look at verse 1, chapter 3. And word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. The only time you hear of God speaking was that unnamed prophet that came. <clears throat> Folks, look this way, please. I want to talk to you about knowing the voice of the Lord. <clears throat> One of the most important things you can learn. In the middle of this dearth, this famine of the Word of God, God appears to Samuel. The Lord called Samuel. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the Word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. He didn't know the voice of the Lord. He was a praying boy. He was 12 years old at the time. <clears throat> he, he loved God, and, but he didn't know God in a theological way. He didn't know Him in the full revelation. <clears throat> but I want you to see something. God called. He spake to Samuel. He wasn't speaking to Eli. See, he's not speaking in that dead church system. But he is speaking today. He's going to speak, not just through preachers in the pulpit, evangelists and missionaries. God's trying to raise up an army of people who know his voice, who hear from him directly. There's an Eli ministry today that's fattened, compromising. It's lost all discernment, all spiritual authority. Do you know why Hophni and Phinehas never listened to their father? He lost his spiritual authority because they saw his compromise. They just laughed at him. And folks, that's what's needed in the church today, the spiritual authority of God. Those that can stand and say, Thus saith the Lord, because it's backed up with a life of righteousness. Now let me tell you something about hearing from God. It takes more than just open ears. I've heard people talk about how to learn the voice of God. Folks, listen to me. It takes more than just what Samuel said. Here am I, Lord, speak. <clears throat> That's what Eli told him to say. Here I am, Lord, speak. It's going to take more than that. It's going to take more than just quiet times with the Lord. Just sitting there saying, Lord, speak to me. There's no formula. You don't need ten steps on how to hear the voice of God. Listen to me now. <clears throat> you can't hear God's voice until he's speaking. Hey, what Eli could have spent all month long shut in with God and said oh God speak to me he never heard the voice of God because God wasn't talking to him God wasn't speaking to him you know what Jesus said my sheep know voice but what else did he say they hear when I call in other words they hear my voice when I'm speaking when I'm speaking folks you can listen all day if God's not talking what's, what's the point God only talks to those who talk to Him. God only talks to those who are said, No, He'll talk to the church, but He'll talk in one word syllables. Repent! Turn! I'll tell you who He's talking to. He's talking to those like Samuel with a pure heart. With a heart open. How it must have grieved Samuel when he saw Eli's sons committing adultery and their mockery making fun and joking, filthy mouth men. How this tender heart of Samuel must have grieved. God came to his bedside, began to speak. And what was the first thing God told Samuel? God, told, God implanted in Samuel, and he's doing it in the remnant. He planted a vision of God that says God will not put up with sin in his house. He, he told Samuel, he said, I'm going to judge. I told him. He said, I'm going to start judgment soon. And I'm going to end it. I'm going to judge Eli because he knew his sons were wicked and he would not judge them. He would not restrain them. Those young pastors should have been stripped of their robes, 
They should have been told, you can't go near the holy place. They should have been put out of the ministry. Eli's job was to do that, and he wouldn't do it. And God says, now, I want to show you, Samuel. And the first thing God said to him, I want to show you my hatred for sin in my house. I want to show you my hatred for compromising the ministry. I want to show you what it's going to take, Samuel, to hear my voice and to walk with me. And Samuel heard it, how he must have shuddered when he thought that that this man he so admired, God was going to leave him. He was going to be judged. How it must have grieved him when God told him, I'm going to destroy those ministers and I'm going to raise up, Samuel, a people that are after my heart. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli. Eli couldn't, I don't know, he knew that God was talking to him in the middle of the night. If he really wanted to know what God said, he'd have gone in to that boy's room and said, what did God say? He waited till morning. He said, Samuel, I can see him just taking by the shoulders and said, Samuel, God called you. God spoke to you last night. Now you tell me what he said. God, so help me if you don't tell me. He shook him. I want to know what God said. What did God say to you? Isn't that a shame? This man had been in the ministry for over 50 years and doesn't know God's voice and has to shake a little boy's shoulder to get a word from heaven. No one tell you what's happening. The time is coming. The time is coming when people are going to want to hear this word from heaven. The Bible said, God so moved on Samuel, none of his words fell to the ground. In other words, nothing he said was empty. What he said, he heard from heaven. And folks, if you want to hear from God, God will speak to you. That means you don't go into his presence. You don't go into his presence carrying your load of sin with you. You allow God to deal with that sin. You allow God to take that temper away from you and sanctify it. You ask God to do what he has to do in your life. And you go into the presence of the Lord and say, Oh Lord, I want you to purge and sanctify me and cleanse me because I want to come to you with clean hands and a pure heart. And I want to hear you speak to my heart. God's raising up a holy people that know the voice of God. They're not going to have to go to some advances and get a word. We got people running all the United States trying to get a word. You know why they? Because God's not talking to them. I don't want God to talk to me through somebody else. I want to hear it right from his heart, right from his lips. I've got to do another. I, I've got to get on with this. Number three. This remnant is going to be trained in true deliverance through the knowledge of the ways of God. I'm telling you, folks, listen to me, please, if you haven't heard anything else. What's coming to America is such such chaos. Do you know why Louis Farrakhan is becoming so popular? He's on the front page, I think it's Time Magazine. In the black community, Louis Farrakhan is second in popularity only to Jesse Jackson. He's more popular now than Martin Luther King. That's what it says. And out of his innermost being is spewing hatred. Then on the other side, you've got on radio, you've got white radio talk hosts that are stirring up full of hate. Right here in New York, some of those white men hate blacks with a passion. I can't listen to any of that garbage. But folks, it doesn't look very serious right now, but very soon, not far off, when the economic chaos comes, you watch what happens. There'll be armies of blacks, armies of whites, Jews against black, black against Jew, black against Korean, Korean against black. Folks, the race wars that I'm talking about, I've warned you and warned you and warned you. How many have heard my warnings? I have, until I I just, anymore, it just uh, seems people don't want to listen. I want you to hear it. Hear it good. America's headed for chaos and a collapse. 
And the word deliverance is going to take on a whole new meaning. Right now, the word deliverance to most of us, we talk about deliverance meaning. You know, somebody's eye opened or somebody throwing away their cane and, and you know, we see television cameras and, and, and that's supposed to be a deliverance meaning. Folks, the word deliverance is going to change its meaning. People are just going to want safety. People are going to want to hear a word from God. When does this end? What's God doing? Is this God's judgment? People are going to wonder. They're going to look everywhere searching. And the word deliverance is going to come down. Listen to me, please. From, for people, God's ordinary people, not pastors, but you in the pew, who are so calm, so peaceful, because God's with you. You're hearing from heaven. God told you he's going to protect you. God told you an angel is going to walk with you. God told you all this was coming, so you're not upset. And people are going to come to you for deliverance. The new deliverance ministry is going to be those who can say, come on, sit down. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what's going to happen. And you, there are going to be people reaching out just to hear somebody, to see somebody with calm and peace that's not going crazy. The Bible said men's hearts will fail them for fear. Watching those things coming on the earth. People dropping with heart attacks all around you. People fanatical. People I, I've seen in a, in a picture in my mind, and I believe the Lord put it there. I saw hundreds of cars fleeing New York, and I saw car camps out in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, everywhere. Cars out in the fields, people sleeping in their cars to get away for a few weeks from the chaos. Folks, it's going to be beyond anything we could imagine. But there's going to be a holy remnant that are steadfast and sure, unmovable. You go to 1 Samuel. I'll show you 1 Samuel, 7th chapter, number 7. With this, I close. Seventh chapter, verse 7. That's not, that's not the one I want. I think it's over in... Uh... <clears throat> Let me just tell it to you. Folks, listen to me, please. The Philistines gathered against Israel to do battle. The Bible said, and Samuel cried. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Lord thundered on that day with great thunder upon the Philistines. They were smitten before Israel. Here's what happened. And this is what you have to hear before I close. Samuel said, I want you to all gather at Mizpah with me. He said, I'm going to tell you the way out. Because over 50,000, 70 people had died because they peeked into the ark. And everywhere the ark was, people were dying like flies. The whole land was in chaos. Can you imagine 50,070 men dropping dead? People said, who can stand before such a holy God? This judgment, is, it has to be God. We know it's God. Nobody knew what to do. They said, who shall go up for us? How are we going to stop this plague? What do we do? And there was one man who had the answer. It was Samuel, the remnant. He called the people together, and the Bible said he judged them. He judged their sin. He exposed sin in the camp. And the Bible said they fasted before the Lord, and they humbled themselves, and they prayed. And the Bible said, while Samuel stood before the altar offering the sacrifice, God came and thundered against the Philistines, and there was a great slaughter, and God's people won the victory. Why? Because one man knew the answer. One man knew what to do. He'd heard from God. And folks, the day is coming. People, all, your neighbors and everybody you work with, everything else, they're going to want to hear from them. There's got to be answers. Folks, you, you shouldn't have to come to Times Square Church and hear what Brother Dave Wilkerson or other Don or Bob or anybody else has heard from the Lord. God has so instilled in you a prince, the principles of walking with God. 
You so hear from God. You so into this book. You don't have to have a teacher teach it to you. Because God's working on you. He's going to do it, folks. He's doing it now. Why do you think God started this church in the heart of Babylon? Right here at Times Square. Why do you think you're sitting here in your seat right now? It's not a happenstance. It's not just something that happened. This is a part of what he's doing. We're just a small part of it. But we're a part of what God's doing in New York City and other cities. God came ahead of the riots. God came ahead of the collapse. God came and prepared. I know. Years ago. Two years before we came. I walked these streets weeping. I had a, a little garage up on top of the garage, a little study. And I spent hours on my face. And God said, I want you to go to New York City, and I'm going to raise up a holy remnant. I'm going to attract them from all kinds of walks of life. I'm going to raise up a holy remnant, and I'm going to prepare them for the judgment that's coming. And that's why God raised up this church. I tell you, I don't, believe me, I don't have an ounce of pride in me about this church. If God wants this building and puts us in a barn, I'd go to a barn. We're not married to this building. And I didn't come here to preach sermons. I didn't come here just to marry and bury. <laughs> Folks, we do all of that. And we do it joyfully. But there's a divine, eternal purpose. <clears throat> Next year, the Lord's going to allow me to go, no doubt, to preach to ministers in various parts of the world occasionally. I'm going to be here. I'm not abandoning this. God's told me that I'm to take this post until I die. There's no way you can throw me out of this church. <laughs> now, if I were immoral or something, that's another story. But I've, God's kept us true to his, his face and his name. But I want you to know something here, folks. God is doing something supernatural. You've got to understand that now. You're not just coming here to church. You're coming here now th that God would put divine principles in your soul and fire you up and get you off the fence and get you seeking His face and, and deal with sin in your heart. Somebody told me the other day, a preacher called, they had a minister in their pulpit. They went out, to, they had a visiting evangelist and this friend of mine, or acquaintance of mine, took him out to eat. And he said, uh, <clears throat> you weren't right on. You didn't have the anointing today. There's something wrong. And he blurted out. I said, oh, you're just like Dave Wilkerson in that Times Square bunch. The, the image is that too hard on sin and too much doomsday. Folks, I know it's coming, but I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. And I'm asking God first to deal with my heart, and all the pastors pray the same way, and then come to you with broken hearts, bearing the burden of the Lord. And I'm telling you, God is trying to get you on your face before Him so that He can deal with you as, as a father with a son or a daughter. I'm not saying we have an angry God mad at you. I'm saying God in His mercy is trying to raise up a people in this city that are going to be leavened in the lump. You're going to have Pentecost.